technical. We're, we're going to try not to talk about uh, highly technical things. But once again, thank you for giving us this half hour. So um, first, uh, a little intro why. Um, we're each going to kind of tell a little story of a patient that, that we have. And uh, I find we, both of us with physical therapy and, and in podiatry, we're treating people every single day with plantar fasciitis. And I want to give an example of a woman that I was seeing recently. She's a 35-year-old female. She came in and she had been dealing with heel pain for three years. And she kept on hoping that it would go away. It initially started when she was trying to work out for exercise to shed a, shed a little bit of weight after having a couple of children. And, and it never got, it never went away. And so part of her reason for keeping active is she, she was trying to lose weight. And when you have really bad heel pain, you can't do anything. It's, it's debilitating. So for me, when I was able to treat her, send her over to physical therapy, uh, do some different types of treatments. I think she had some shockwave therapy and, and things like that, getting her into orthotics. She could be active during her recovery. So that's kind of why I like to help people. And, and Joe, you, you had a, a marathon patient, right, recently? Yeah, so I have a marathon patient right now. She's at that mid 13 mile running t uh, distance and she started becoming having foot pain. Uh, she's in physical therapy, we're taking care of the foot pain, um, but we still gotta keep her cardio up. So we're having her do things like um, swimming, getting on the bike, um, pedaling uh, for that uh, two hour mark and keeping that heart rate where it is so she can keep her cardio up while she's still training and still getting better so she can get back into the running part of it. Yeah, so I think that's, that's key is, is keeping people active so they can either lose weight or run their marathon or, you know, not have to switch sports. But I, I do tell people once in a while, you know, if you have, a, for example, other things like a stress fracture, that might be a good opportunity to kind of learn another sport like swimming or something else like that if it's, if it's too debilitating. So let's get right into it. The two types of heel pain that we're talking about, I would say 90%, maybe 95%, are something called plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendinitis. Now, the reason we're talking about heel pain uh, generically is because both of these, if you look, this is the heel bone or the calcaneus, both of these insert into the heel. The plantar fascia inserts into the bottom and the Achilles inserts into the back. So in my opinion, they're pretty much the same thing. And they're treated very similarly. Why you get one versus the other, it's maybe a flip of the coin. There might be some what we call biomechanics or how your foot structure is or how tight you are. But a lot of people, they come in with plantar fasciitis and then maybe later on they'll develop Achilles tendonitis. And I think the big culprit is the back of the calf. And no one ever complains of back of calf pain. And when I bring up, you know, working the back of the calf or working the, your core or working your quads or your glutes or your, your other things more up or more proximal, everyone wonders why. It's, it's because the foot is just a symptom of what's happening higher up. And so that's why it's essential if you really want to get rid of it and avoid injury, you have to work on everything else higher up. And, and your, all it is is how your body moves over your foot. So if your body is moving over abnorm, abnormally, that needs to be fixed, specifically in your pelvis. That's a big area or hip range of motion. Um, another thing that people uh, should know of, some, they actually have degeneration of the tendon. So you can see here, this is a, a thickened tendon and it develops scar tissue. That's called a bulbous, looks like a bulb, a bulbous change in the Achilles. Now, if you think about it, if you have a piece of string and you tie a whole bunch of knots in it, that string is going to reduce in length because it takes up space, those knots. And it's the same thing in the Achilles and the same thing of the fascia. You're going to see later on when I talk about the ultrasound, it gets thicker. If it's thicker, it inherently gets shorter. When it gets shorter, it's going to put more strain on those on those tissues. So in, in my opinion, I think about 80% is due to tightness, tightness in the back of the calf that then leads to Achilles tendonitis or plantar fasciitis. For some patients that can be caused by flat feet, over pronation, uh, increasing your activity. The big, the big story I get is people, they go to um, Disney and they don't have plantar fasciitis and they come back with plantar fasciitis basically because they've been on their feet for six or eight hours a day and they're in flip flops. And then, they, yeah, and on cement, and they're walking a whole bunch, 
or they're starting to work out and they're trying to do a marathon or a half marathon and then they get it and it never calms down. If you get help right away, it can calm down and it can you can get help. What I was talking about in terms of the, the, um, the imaging, you can either do an ultrasound or an x-ray. We always get x-rays first to see if there's any bone spur, but it, it's not as important in my opinion if you have a spur or not. A spur shows that you have traction on either the fascia or on the Achilles. So basically, this is an example of the right plantar fascia. This is the heel, and this is the fascia, this little fibrous thing. If you pull hard enough on this bone, it's gonna create a spur out here. That's called Wolf's Law. Your body, it responds to pulling over a period of time. So the goal is to reduce that pulling or that traction. But what happens with the fascia, if it's been there for a while, you can see this thickness, the distance between the two A's, and then the distance right here between the two A's. This, it looks darker, looks black, and it's thicker. That's chronic plantar fasciosis. It, it gets thickened over time. If you're looking at an ultrasound in a patient that just has plantar fasciitis, it's gonna look the same thickness and the same color. If it's been there for a couple of months, it's gonna get white, it's gonna get um, black, and it's gonna get thicker. And that means there's chronic effusion or, or swelling inside of that tissue. And you may need a different type of treatment to get rid of that the longer it is. I usually use three months. If you've had it for three months, you're going to probably need some of the more advanced treatments. If it's less than three months, you know, you, you came in sooner, but most people don't come in right away. This is a, a lengthwise evaluation of an Achilles. You can see this little black line. So it's looking right down the Achilles. And this has a little bit of a tear right in that area, and then it's thicker. Once again, this thickness is kind of like scar tissue, and that doesn't allow it to be as flexible, and that needs treatment. And, you know, Achilles is a hard area because you can't really do a cortisone injection to that because it could cause a rupture. And so that's, those are kind of the, the, uh, the aspects of the imaging. So Joe's going to talk a little bit about stretching here. So stretching is key, and that's what we kind of promote. When the, the patient comes in, we'll ask them what their stretching program is, and they'll probably have nothing at all. They just, nope, I just go running, I just go exercise, and I don't have time for stretching. So most of the patients that are here for physical therapy because they don't stretch. So we'll go over a nice routine of good stretching. Um, we'll make sure that they know the stretching, they have their stretching, they'll have the pictures for it so they can work on their own stretching. Um, along with that, we do the foam rolling. We make sure their pelvis is aligned, make sure all the joints are working so that, that the whole leg is working for the foot and the foot is working for the, the legs. So Joe, talk a little bit about the, your habits. Let's say someone has Achilles or plantar fascia, how many minutes do they need to dedicate to stretching? Or here's an example of, of foam rolling. How much time are they gonna have to? We usually dedicate? tell them about two minutes per muscle area. So they're gonna get on their calf, they're gonna go back and forth, they're gonna work it out for a good two minutes, different angles. So they're gonna take their foot, they're gonna change their foot angle back and forth, like they're kind of almost like running in and out, trying to hit the different fibers of each of those muscles. How many times a day? Um, it, it's up to them, at least once or twice. But if you know they're exercising run, we want to do before and afterward, just to keep everything nice and loose. And should it hurt? Is it okay to hurt? Um, it's gonna hurt. Uh, it's just that determining what kind of hurt it is. If it's a bad hurt, then we have to hold off. If it's a good working hurt, then that's still okay. And after that, we can ice and stem or whatever they want to do to kind of calm it down. Uh, and then how about those, 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 the, the people run, pushing against the wall, the runner stretch or letting your heels go down the eccentric contracture? Um, explain that a little bit, those types of uh, stretches. That's just a nice, good lengthening stretch. Um, I usually tell them not to stretch to the point where it's painful. It shouldn't be too painful, but it should get a good, comfortable stretch out of it. Yeah, I, I think a lot of times you'll go to see a doctor and they'll just recommend stretching, primary care. You go to your primary care, they're going to recommend a shoe insert, maybe a new shoe, and then stretching, anti-inflammatories, icing. If that doesn't get better, then they'll probably send you to physical therapy or to see a podiatrist. Um, I think... Uh, foam rolling is in deep tissue work is key. And then if, so I basically foam rolling is that two to three minutes on each muscle group. Maybe I say 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at night. That's what I say. And then during the day, you can do your stretches. Like if you're at work or if you're at a stair or something else like that, but it has to become part of your routine. Now, even when they're recovered, do they have to continue doing this? Yeah, that'll, that'll keep them out of the doctor's office and out of PC. Keep working, keep stretching, keep foam rolling. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people uh, I have uh, a, a lack of uh, movement because we're, we're very sedentary and we sit down a lot. I think a, a lot of the culprit is we have sit down jobs, 
we sit at desks all the time and you can speak better to that but everything gets kind of tight and then people start working out or they go to disney or something like that and, and they wonder well how come i developed heel pain or something like that for sure yeah okay talk about this here what's this all right so another way we can uh, adapt the tissue or kind of break up that strategy is called uh, uh, fibroblasting so we have the tools you can see the tools up here um, these are the tools that people love to hate because they hate it when we do it but they love it afterward because they feel so much better so basically we're digging into the muscle we're breaking up all the fibers and we're stretching it out so we'll do it at different angles at different points um, and we'll do it actually with movement sometimes just so we can break up those fibers so we can get the the muscle working better and, and so what uh like technologically what is it doing to the tissue is it lengthening it is it helping it to repair what is it doing all the above so basically we're breaking up the scar tissue increasing the blood flow and we'll do it at different points of, of the uh, joint angle so that we can hit different areas of the muscles yeah and so what, what joe's talking about on that ultrasound when i showed you that it was thicker i guess you could call that scar tissue or thickened tissue and then he takes this and he, and he rubs it on that area. Um, what I find is that when you do treatment such as this or shockwave, it can actually thin down over time. That swelling goes down from within that tissue and it can thin it down to more of a normal level, but just like scarring anywhere else. Uh, for example, if you have a surgery or if you have a cut, it's gonna be initially swollen, thick and scarred. And then over about six months to a year, it's gonna remodel and it's gonna get that thinner, um, little line, you're always going to have a scar, but the whole goal is that it's not as swollen. And part of the problem is we never stop. You know, we are no. always busy. I, I find especially kids, you know, we don't see this as much in kids, but like we're going from one sport to another sport. We're either sitting down or very active and no one gives anything a chance to kind of rest and recover. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's an issue. How important are shoes, Joe? Shoes are key. Um, so we have pronated, supinated, and neutral feet. And most runners, even they're, if they've been doing multiple marathons, really don't know about their feet. They'll find a particular sneaker and they'll just go with it. And more likely they're in pain. But once we see them, we'll evaluate their foot to see if which, what type they are. And there's different shoes that fit for different kinds of feet, especially for runners. Um, on the top right, you'll see the New Balance. You'll see the yellow band in there, and that's a guy, so it's a pronator. So we'll, it's an anti-pronator. So it's a bar in there, so it won't lock, let your foot cave in as much. And that will cause the, the pronation pain, it will ca cause knee pain right up to the hip pain for these runners. The one on the bottom is more of a neutral. You can see where it's just basically a nice, good sole, nice, good, and soft. That's someone that um, has a more neutral foot and needs, that, needs to be able to sl just slide through when they're going through the running process. And that's after. Afterward, when you feel nice and sore, you get into a nice, good uh, sandal like that. And it just makes you feel good. Yeah, I, I keep it real simple. Everyone asks me, hey, Doc, am I going to have to wear ugly shoes the rest of my life? I say, it's, it's, it's for now. It's not forever. Okay. And um, I say, when you're at home, if you don't want to wear shoes, I like either an UFO or there's a Hoka sandal, something with a really good arch support when you're, when you're at home, or it's a, it's a better alternative to a flip-flop now you can tell something's good when when you give it to your mom so when my mom came and visited me she had a bunion surgery and she i i put her in these things and she absolutely loved them it could be from the cushion could be from the arch uh, but there's a, a lot of things these, these shoes are, are are great now specifically i want to talk a little bit about a little to get a little technical here a lot of shoes you can see here it's thicker at the heel than it is at the toe and it has this little curvature thing here. So this is kind of like a little rocker in the front of the foot. And this is a probably a five to seven mil millimeter drop. And what that means is the height here down to there is about five millimeters. This works well with someone with Achilles tendonitis and plantar fasciitis because if you have a, what we'll call a zero drop shoe or a, a, it's exactly the same height, that's gonna put more pressure on the back of the Achilles. Now, even though I do recommend a lot of shoes that are zero drop, I find that when you're recovering from one of these conditions, you tend to do better with a shoe with a little bit of a heel in it. Is that what you find as well? For sure. Yeah. Some of my Achilles patients, um, I'll ask them, have they changed their shoes? And then some of them will go from the zero drop to an, another sneaker, a Nike sneaker with a higher uh, heel bed. And that's what's probably given the issues. 
uh, going to a higher arch. Well, or, actually, uh, a lower a arch. A lower arch, like a, yeah. Like a, so I'll tell them to go back to the original sneaker that they they had, and things should get better. Yeah, I think. And how long uh, should should sneakers last your patients? Everybody's a little bit different. It depends on how you know how heavy you are, how much running you're doing. But I tell people, you know, that four to six months, you just kind of evaluate how you're feeling. Um, I tell them write the date on the sole so they know when they bought them, and just tell them when they start getting that pain again, you can look down and see where you're at. And in terms of shoes, can they go to like a DSW, or do you recommend going to a, a running shoe place? Um, I send all my people to Sneakerama. Uh, we have a script. We'll write down the script. They will evaluate the foot. They'll look at the script, they'll look at the sneakers, they'll choose, they'll give them three or four options, and that's how we usually do it. Yeah, the real key is you want to go to a place that they're going to watch you walk, and they'll be able to get something that's appropriate for you. You know, I can't emphasize, when you're when you're starting to deal with heel pain, if you're, if you're just in the beginning, it's, it's about, it's shoes is key. And you may say, oh, I have tons of shoes. I particularly don't like some of these cuter shoes, the Skechers, the Nikes, the things like that, they haven't really kept up with the technology. Whereas the New Balance, the Saucony, uh, the Asics and things like that, they have a, a better shoe. Now, for those patients, Joe, that come in and say, you know, you know, Joe, I, I tried 10 shoes and my heel still doesn't feel better. What do you tell them? That's when I usually promote Dr. Pelto <laughs> for orthotics, yeah. you know, we'll tape them, see how yeah. the taping feeling, if that feels well. Go see Dr. Pelto for orthotics and go from there. Yeah, Joe, that, that's the key. It's like if you've tried 20 pairs of shoes and the shoe hurts and it only hurts on your right foot because your right foot has spine fascia, so the problem isn't the shoe. Don't go buying more shoes. And don't you can spend like thousands of dollars on Amazon trying to buy every single thing. Uh, don't do that. You can save a lot of time and a lot of money by, by seeing someone. So how about activity modifications if you're wanting to stay active? Sure. So if, if the running or the walking part hurts, there's other ways of doing it. So say you're, you're walking or running on the cement or tire, you can get you onto a treadmill or you can go to a track that's a lot softer. That'll help out a little bit. You can do some cycling. Cycling will keep you going, but it won't put a lot of force through, that, um, through your foot. Um, strengthening your core is always key. And then for some people, if they're running, if they're doing a marathon and they can't really put a lot of weight, we'll get them in the pool and we'll do some running mm -hmm. in the pool. That will burn them out real quick. We'll give them the, all the exercise, but it won't put all that force on that foot. And, and there's a, a, a special treadmill that they make, right? The, yeah. the, 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 the was it called the G4s? The G4, yeah. And you, you're pretty much sitting in a saddle and then it, you can take off 50% of the weight, 30% of the weight, and you can still get that cardio that you like. Uh, that, that's a good option if you're having a lot of pain. Now, how about if someone, let's say, Joe, someone has pain when they get up in the morning, but when they do their stretches and things like that, everything goes away. Can they be as active or how do you determine how, how, how active you can be? Yeah, they can be. As soon as, as the pain's gone, let them do what they, their workout it is. And it's, it's all based, based on the pain. If the pain increases, then we have to slow it down a little bit. Yeah. I, I always say if you're limping and if you're changing your gait or if you're going to injure yourself because of because you're a change, accommodating how you're, you're going to injure yourself. You're going to have to go see Joe. You're, you're going to throw your hip off. You're going to throw something else off because you're changing your gait. And if it's that level, you're going to have to switch your activity temporarily until you get calm, until you get calmed down. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the initial treatments. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail about all of them. There's like hundreds of treatments, but a, a few things if you're trying to deal with this. Um, something that you may not have heard of is something called a contrast bath. And everyone knows about like taking the bottle of water and rolling it on the bottom of the foot or a bottle on the back of the calf of ice water. But a contrast bath, if you've never tried it, you take a bucket of ice water and a bucket of hot water. You know, you don't want to burn yourself. And you do five minutes in the ice water, five minutes in the hot water, and then five in the ice. You always start and end in the ice water. And what that does is it basically restarts, reboots the computer. So it's going to cause, the ice is going to cause vasoconstriction, meaning it's going to shrink down. The, the hot water is going to vasodilate, it's going to swell, and then it's going to shrink down again. It's kind of shocking the area to help increase the blood flow, all of its blood flow getting to that area. So if you want to think about it, if you want your body to heal itself, you have to have adequate blood flow. And there are things that can restrict the blood flow. Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about. Um, anti-inflammatories, I don't do more than two weeks of an anti-inflammatory. It can be used temporarily if you like, okay? Um, I, 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 once in a while you do a prednisone, not too much. I'm not too much of an anti-inflammatory person. I think you should work on the treatments of getting rid of the pain, okay? Um, I want to talk a little bit about 
offloading. Now, uh, the reason I want to talk about this is because if you want to stay active, you're going to have to take the tension off the fascia or off the Achilles. And there are different levels of pain reduction. I'm going to start with the, kind of the most severe. So if your pain level is an 8, 9, or a 10, what we call an, on, on that visual analog scale, basically you look at the, the, the frowning face and the happy face. And if you're, if you're basically limping around, you're going to probably need to be in a walking boot for a short period of time, or if you have a, a tear or something else like that. Now, the key, I can see so many people, they come in with the boot, but then they complain of hip pain or back pain or something else like that. That's why I just want to take a moment to talk about this thing. This is called an even up. So if you ever get a boot or if you ever see someone that has a boot and they're limping around, you have you can use an even up or you can use a shoe with a little bit of a heel. So you can just buy it on Amazon. It's called an even up. So that's the worst amount of pain. The next, the next kind of, if you're, if you're only in moderate pain, there are two options. One is called an air cast. And the other one is called a velocity brace. And I want to explain both of these. The purpose of these are to be used temporarily, okay? Just like the boot, you're not using these forever. Uh, the air cast, it has a bladder of air in the bottom and a bladder of air in the back of the Achilles. So as you're walking, it's pushing the air back and forth with a little tube and it's massaging the back of the Achilles to increase blood flow. And it's, as you push here, it's taking pressure off the heel. So it can be used both for plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendonitis. This isn't my first go-to, but these are for people that have quite a bit of pain and you do this, I would say for two to four weeks. Uh, for patients that, that need more stability to avoid pronation, this is called a velocity brace. It, it's kind of like an AFO, an a, AFO is an ankle, so it involves the ankle and a foot and it's, it's an orthotic. So it has a little orthotic piece in the bottom and it also has an ankle brace. So this won't allow people to invert or evert. It won't allow that pronation to happen and it puts less strain. So specifically patients that have posterior tibial tendonitis or tendonitis on this tendon on the inside or a lot of flattening, they're gonna work well on this. Another reason that this works well is because it works in one unit. And what I say is my expectation is about 30% of the pressure is going to go into the lower leg. So it's going to attenuate or take the pressure off the back of the Achilles and off the fascia and put it into the lower leg. It's a lot easier to get used to this than it is a big bulky boot. These are both only used, I would say, two to four weeks when you're in the recovery period. I don't use it for a long, a long time. Once people are, are feeling better, then I'm gonna transition them to an orthotic. And, and the way I use orthotics is I use it to correct posture. Okay, go ahead. Nope, nope. So orthotics, there's different types. You can try an over-the-counter insert and there are different ones. Once again, if you're gonna get an insert, uh, please don't, I hope, hope Dr. Scholes isn't listening, mm -hmm. but don't get a Dr. Scholes because they're overpriced and they're not doing anything. What I would recommend is going to Sneakerama and what you're gonna find is you're gonna find a, an over-the-counter insert, usually like a Spenco, something that's more rigid, because when it's rigid, it's actually doing something. Patients can start with an over-the-counter one. But the, the main key, and I wanna explain this for everyone, is when you have uh, an, an orthotic, they did some research and they found that with the fascia, the higher the orthotic contours to the foot, the better it takes the strain and stress off the fascia. And what you'll find is a normal insert is going to be a big gap between there. And that gap still allows pronation and it doesn't take as much strain off. That's the reason we do a custom one because it, it basically sits right with the arch and it, that takes more of the strain off. And you just can't do that with an over-the-counter because you don't have an over-the-counter foot and no one does. But for a lot of patients, an over-the-counter is a good way to start. And if that's not enough, then we'll move someone into a custom orthotic and, and that's, and that's, and they're, they're made to be used. Maybe not the rest of your life. Everyone asks me, do I have to wear them the rest of my life? Probably not. You're going to wear them until you feel better. And then for certain types of activities that could aggravate your plantar fascia. Anything else you want to say about these? Joe? How about a patient that has the orthotics, mm -hmm. but they're still having pain. And if I tape them, they feel better. Yeah, I think taping is great. And, and I don't tape, you guys tape. Yep. Um, I think what taping does is it holds everything in proper position. I, a, lot of, a lot of doctors, what they do is if they have a custom orthotic already, 
then that custom orthotic isn't contouring enough. So you may need something that's even higher. Yeah. And the big problem for us going too high is that it's not going to be comfortable, but doing a, a higher one is going to feel even better. That's why that taping feels good, that's that extra support, but you can't tape for the rest of your life. No. So you still have to kind of get that, get that area down. Okay. Yeah. You may need a higher contouring orthotic because there are a lot they, they there are a lot of places around that they say it's a custom orthotic, but it's really not. They, they say, well, it's made for you. You step in a box or something else like that. The way we do it is with like a 3D scanner and we make it specifically for you. So you have to go to a place. Yeah, are they going to be more expensive? Yeah, but these over-the-counter ones that last maybe six months and you have to change it. So, uh, And then I want to talk a little bit about questions about doing a cortisone injection, and then there's a new type of therapy called shockwave. So the way I think about it is if you're in a lot of pain, if you're limping around, if you've had this and you just can't function in life, and so basically if you're looking at an eight, nine, or a 10 pain, you can't tolerate shockwave, you can't tolerate physical therapy, you're gonna be limping around, you can't do anything. So for patients like that, if it's in the heel, I will do, a cortisone injection, okay? If it's under eight, if it's seven or below, and then if I do an ultrasound and I see that it's thicker, that's where I'll recommend the shockwave. Now, I, I don't do this usually first line, meaning what, what I do first is I say, change your shoes, try the inserts, try the icing, try the anti-inflammatories. If that doesn't work, then what I tend to do is I switch to the shockwave and the physical therapy, okay? People start with the foam rolling, and then if, if that doesn't work, then they go under the shockwave and the physical therapy. Um, what, how this works, there are two types of shockwaves, but you see this little thing that looks like a bullet. This bullet runs back and forth and it hits this piece of metal and it creates something called radial shockwaves, okay? There's two different devices we have, one that's focused and one that's radial. I'm just showing you the radial one. This is the one that we've had for a number of years, but what does it do? Basically, areas that are chronically injured, like the fascia in the Achilles tendon, they get thickened, they get scarred. And if you know anything about scar tissue, it doesn't have the best blood flow. The flow is bad. And what, what you try to do with your Braston technique, or there's another physical therapy modality called um, dry needling, uh, that, what that does is that tries to increase the blood flow to the area so your own body heals it, okay? And that's what this does. I whack the heck out of it and it increases the blood flow. So during the course of treatment with shockwave, you can't do any anti-inflammatories, Motrin, ibuprofen, you can do Tylenol two days before and two days after. And we do between three and six sessions. And what that does is that increases the blood flow to the area and, it, and it's, mad, it's almost like magic. And it, and it takes away the pain. There are some other advanced ones as well, like platelet-rich plasma or amnio injections. We might do those if there's a tear or something else we specifically see on the ultrasound, but this is our go-to for treating. I used to do a ton of cortisone, but what I found with cortisone, I had a patient today, I did a cortisone, he had it four weeks ago, and he was feeling a little bit better for about two, two to three weeks, and then all of a sudden all the pain came back. The reason for that is cortisone only lasts about four, four to six weeks, depending on what type you put in. We do a combination of a short acting and a long acting, and then what I find is when it wears off, if you don't change the tissue or the structure with the foam rolling and the physical therapy and the offloading, it, it can come back, not for everyone, but it can come back. But what this does is it actually heals uh, the tissue. What's been your experience with this, Joe? We're seeing a lot more patients with shockwave and they usually like it. They'll come in, we'll do the, the stretching and the checking out the pelvis, getting all the joints working and we'll just work with uh, their pain level and, and getting them better. Yeah, I, I think it's been a real practice changer, especially in the Achilles. On the back and the Achilles, you can't do cortisone because it could cause a rupture. So we really didn't have many options besides uh, doing a surgery if there's a big bump back there or, or something else. Now with patients that um, are not coming from a podiatrist and have heel pain, what I'll do is I'll show them the book mm -hmm. uh, by Don Pelto and I'll open up the page with Shockwave so they can read about Shockwave. Then I'll give, give them the card so they can call Don and see if they can do the Shockwaves for them. Yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't, it's really been a practice changer there. There's been only a few things, I've been doing this for about, I don't know, over 10 years now, but this has been a practice changer. And it's something that's, it, it tended to start, I'll tell you a little history of it. Uh, Shockwave, it started in Germany and it was used to break up kidney stones. So what they did is they put people in big things of water and they still use it to this day. And they shoot these sound waves with this huge shockwave machine 
and it broke up the kidney stones. But what they found is that people with chronic back pain, because a lot of times back pain is caused by the tightness in the muscles, their back pain went away. And they're like, hmm, I wonder why their back pain went away when we're treating their kidneys. And then, then the machines got smaller and smaller. And instead of putting people in water, now we put ultrasound gel on it. And what we're finding, and it's not just using the foot, it's used pretty much everywhere in your body for area of chronic inflammation to help it naturally reduce it. And, and I think the reason they do it more in Germany is I th it might be, I think it's covered by insurance there. And they're more natural than we are. Here we're like running to surgery. There they do everything they can to avoid surgery because they have public health and it takes forever to get a surgery. So that's why they have some of those other options. Um, there were a few questions that people asked. So I, I'd like you, if you're listening here and you had any other questions, uh, put it in the chat box uh, right now. And I, we're gonna start answering the questions that were sent over previously. And then we'll answer the other ones that people have, are putting it to us right now. So I'll ask you, Joe, is it best to avoid impact exercises like aerobic exercises uh, while you're healing? It all depends on your pain level. If you're able to do the exercise without causing increased pain, then it's okay. If you're doing the exercise and causing more pain, that means you, the tissue is being overwhelmed and you got to cut it down. And that's where we can go to the cycling, you got the swimming, you've got the elliptical, that's not pounding as much, but still giving you the aerobic capacity. Yeah, and, and I would say, uh, try doing the shoes and the, um, the offloading with either an orthotic or something else uh, to see how it's doing, or even one of those braces, like that air cast that you mentioned to me, that be you, you could probably stay being active with that. Um, so how do you know what the balance is between pain and exercise therapy for Achilles tendonitis? I don't know if you have any uh, ideas here. Uh, the pain. So it's, there's good pain and there's bad pain. If you're in that bad pain zone, once again, you're over texting that tissue and it's not going to get better. So we got to cut it back, your orthotics, do your stretching, do your scraping, calm it down and then build from there. Perfect. Uh, question three, plantar fasciitis versus Achilles tendonitis. Treatment, any major differences, any studies? And this was uh, sent by one of the colleagues from physical therapy. I usually treat them pretty similar in terms of PT treatments. Um, in terms of plantar fasciitis, I, I think they're almost exactly the same. The only difference is I think uh, plantar fasciitis responds much better to orthotic therapy than Achilles tendonitis. Uh, Achilles tendonitis, there's not really many studies about responding to, to, um, to, uh, to orthotic therapy. I find that Achilles tendonitis tends to re respond a little bit better to heel lifts. So putting a heel lift in there, taking the pull off temporarily, uh, that works for Achilles tendonitis. Um, also treatments in terms of what I do, I don't do cortisone on Achilles. I can do it on plantar fasciitis. The shockwave is all the same. Uh, all the other icing, anti-inflammatories, PT is pretty much the same. Anything else that, that you do different? For both of you, I usually go after the hip. If the hip has really poor range of motion, when they're walking or running, they're always hitting in that same spot on the heel. So I really work the hip, get that range of motion better so they have multiple angles when they're walking or moving to hit different spots. Perfect. Um, so Joe, which shoes are better or worse for it? We kind of addressed that, but. Yeah, um, there's so many shoes out there. Once we, we evaluate the foot, we figure out if your pronate is super neutral and we send you over to the sneaker stop, they'll get the shoe on for it. And then from there, we can evaluate which sneaker works for best for you. Yeah, and, and Joe, does it ever go away? Does it ever go away? Um, it should, but if you don't do your stretching, you don't do all your exercise, you don't do what you're supposed to do, it's gonna creep back. And basically you're just gonna keep on doing it or you can come back to us and we can figure it out again. Yeah, I, I, so I guess there's two ways of thinking about this question. Um, it might go away and then come back. If it's coming back, it tends to be something structural that you're going to need physical therapy for, meaning you may have a, a pelvic issue, you may have a, a stability issue, it might be a tightness issue that's not addressed, it might be an orthotic issue, something else like that, but it should go away. Uh, so going away, coming back, it's usually because of that. I usually say it's like an incident, meaning you went to Disney, you went on a long walk, you're starting to train for something. Uh, very commonly, people that train are starting to be more active, trying to lose weight. The, the calves get tight, not usually day one, day two, day three, but after a few weeks and they, and they start to have foot pain. It's because of the tightness normally. And then the other for you, if you're listening to this and you've had this for years, and it's never gotten better, it's probably because you haven't had treatment or the right kind of treatment. I find many patients, they come as a second opinion, they've like seen a doctor a number of times, 
but they just say, okay, I'll, I'll do three cortisone injections and an orthotic. And if you can't get better, you can't get better. You know, you, you have to really advocate for yourself. There are some advanced treatments, but I, I do have a certain number of patients that just might need a surgical procedure or something more involved. I think I've done maybe one surgery in the last three years. I, there's not really surgery isn't the option. Okay. Isn't the best option, but there are other people that can help you. So you have to kind of advocate for yourself and try to get help. Yeah. And there are some other questions we're going to address here before we uh, finish up here for patients who get custom orthotics. How long do they usually last? What do you tell them? Um, it, so custom orthotics, once again, you have to have the sneaker and shoe to fit with it. If you have the wrong shoe with the orthotics, it's not going to uh, help as much. Um, we're, we're talking three to five years, depending mm -hmm. on how it was built, um, how it was made, and you have to wear it. You have to do all your stretches, all the stuff you do to keep it going. Yeah, orthotics are kind of like glasses, right? I can't, I don't wear my glasses when I'm doing the webinars, but if I'm not wearing these, I can't see far away. But if I'm wearing them, I can see far away. So it, it corrects for mechanical instability in the foot. And it's the same thing with an orthotic. And, and the way I kind of explain it is if you're doing a lot of walking, a lot of standing, um, you, you're probably going to feel better in them. Now, you may only need them for a period of time to heal that injury, though. Once you're better, if you're an athlete, you can probably try to ditch them. But if you have a really, really collapsing foot, you're just going to feel better in them. Some patients just feel better because they're so collapsed uh, for them. Uh, there was some... Uh, comments here about a, a book. Uh, I'll show you guys how you can get these books if you want. I have them uh, as a download. Um, and then uh, and at, at the PT at Greendale, they have them sitting there as well. So when patients are getting shockwave, this is a question here, when patients are getting uh, shockwave therapy and, and attending physical therapy, should they modify the exercise at all? Um, my opinion, if they're getting shockwave, it's, it's usually for, let's say for the, for the heel, I'll have them that session work more on the calf region. Okay, or working on the core stability or something else like that. Um, because if it's way too painful, but frankly, if you do shockwave that day, I would just, the next day you should be better. Shockwave doesn't usually have much pain for a few days after, it doesn't. Another thing about shockwave, shockwave isn't instantaneous, like uh, cortisone injection. Cortisone, you get the cortisone, you're better. Um, shockwave, to, it actually has to create new blood vessels and blood flow to the area, and that takes six to eight weeks. So just for you, so you know, so from day one of shockwave to you actually start seeing the results is six weeks. And so if we do three sessions and I see you six weeks after, that's when it's starting and it works for like three or four months afterwards. And it's not instantaneous. So that's where you have to control the load so people can kind of be active uh, with that as well. Uh, another question here, I wear slippers at home. I think that may be part of my problem. Uh, can you be more specific on what I can wear? What can they wear at home? Um, so a good sandal. So once again, I set them down to seek Rama. They have all, all nice good sandals over there. They have good arch support, a lot of cushion in them, and they're much better in the house. You come into the house, you take your shoes off, you go into your sandals, and you're good to go. Yeah, I, I think uh, there's a couple of brands. Um, Spanko has an okay one. Ufos has a good one. Hoka has a good one. Yep. And you can just wear shoes, though. If you have, a, you get a second pair of shoes, have a home shoe, and wear that at home, and I think you're going to be, you're going to be much better uh, with that. So I think we, we uh, answered all the questions. Um, I put a little link here um, for the, the replay and resources. So if you're, you're watching this, we're gonna post this. You can use your phone and kind of scan it and it'll go to a blog post. And then uh, you can also go to the Greendale PT and, and contact them. They can give you a copy of this video if you wanna listen to it afterwards. Um, there's a couple of resources I make available uh, on my blog, drpelta.com. And there's one thing on a heel and one on Achilles. The one that, uh, uh, Joe was referring to. I'm just going to open it up right here. Look at that. It doesn't even open up. <laughs> you have to have an Achilles with a capital A. Um, and it's a little course I put together. So it basically has a book you can download, a quick start guide, uh, icing and contrasts, UFOs, shoe recommendations. And then um, basically down here, it's kind of cool because I put here, how do you treat Achilles tendonitis? Deep tissue massage and loosening exercises. I actually recorded this at Greendale PT a number of years ago. Trigger point tools what to do when you get up in the morning. This is kind of fun. So if patients, we talk about um, core belly breathing, uh, doing a, a stretching routine before you get out of bed. This is to help that first step out of bed. Talk about shockwave or EPAT and uh, amnio injections and then things like that. So there's other resources. So I take a, a lot of pride in, in doing these things and it's been a, a lot of fun. And I really appreciate all the help over at uh, Greendale PT. So it's been great. I think we've answered all the questions. I don't really see any other questions here. 
Uh, if you guys have any more, you can uh, post it. Otherwise, we're going to uh, stop this uh, presentation.